Morning guys and welcome again for our next talkie block on the training forum. Today's topic is going to be about how to tackle complaints with the CETOS and the QCTO. Um, I just want to welcome our two guest speakers. I've got two guest speakers that uh, that offered to, to join our talkie block today. And the first person, Janine Topping, if you can kindly just introduce yourself and tell us um, how long have you been fighting with the CETAS and the QCTO? I want to give away my age now. Morning is morning and now. Morning, everyone else. Hi, I'm Janine Topping. I'm the founding member of JTNA. Um, we've been assisting training providers for the last 11, going on 12 years now with the accreditation with any of the 21 seaters as well as a QCTO. We, offer, we also offer after accreditation services where we actually help you roll out your training. Is, I'm not gonna use the word fighting with the seaters. I would rather use the word communicating with the seaters for about 12 years now. Um, yeah, so I've got a few tips and tricks to let everybody know later, but I'm sure you want to ask Linnell to introduce herself as well. Thank you, Jan uh, Janine. Linnell, can't you just quickly about yourself and how long have you been uh, struggling with the QCTO? Ezra, um, been in this industry for, for a long time, have been um, seeing people wanting to fight with a lot of CETAs, well, majority of them. Um, with a QSTO, I'm not a fighter, I'm a lover. So I like communicating. Um, I don't like creating problems, I like solving problems. And I think that's our biggest issue these days. We're all complaining, but we don't look at what solutions can we get in order to make it better for all of us. So, um, I try to look at the solutions, not always the problem, because a lot of the problems we create ourselves. And it's not just them, it's also us. So this is like a, um, a tango, a very fierce tango, but you can only do it right if you do it together. So that's me. Welcome, guys. Uh, I had last night a very strange dream. I, I, I dreamt... When we started the webinar, uh, the CEO of the QCTO joined and every single CETA had a staff member on there. And uh, I was, uh, I was, I, I didn't know what to say or what to do. So, yeah, I had uh, a big, let me say, not a dream, a nightmare last night about this webinar. So I'm, I'm happy to see that it's only four people so far. I know strange people. Okay. Guys, I brought my tool today. I'm across with the theater. I want to fight. I feel if I can walk into the theater and hit the doors. Of, um, if, today, we want to we wanna talk about uh, the, the, I think with, during the COVID period, we had, an, you know, extra, I don't want to say issues, but there was definitely challenges during the COVID era, new challenges, communication with the theaters and stuff so today i just want to talk about the type of complaints you think we can get and how should you or before yeah the second thing is um the different departments because i think a lot of people don't understand that you know i've got a contact in the theater you can't help me with everything they you know they operate in different departments you know so you need to speak to the right people and if you want to take a complaint further, then, you know, what is the correct procedure, what you should have in that, uh, you know, to take it up in the, in the channel. So, and then we're going to allow for some extra questions and, and uh, ideas if you guys have. So, if I can just start off with, what do you think is the, the and your experience, Janine, if I could just ask you first, the, the most common complaints generally either to the theater or the qcto that you've experienced over your years is i would say the most common complaint is not hearing back that is the most common complaint oh, it's just a bit soft eh? sorry um is i would say from our side the most common complaint is when we or our clients don't hear back from the seaters or the qcto 
it would be a submission of anything. It would be a submission of accreditation application, assessor moderator registrations, online applications, certificate approval, logo approval, anything. And everything is submitted and you don't hear back. And that to us is the biggest complaint, is that the, the feedback from the various ETQAs and the QCTO is just, there seems to be such a long delay. And we find that that creates the most frustration from our, from our clients. Uh, Linnell, your experience? From my experience, the last two years have been absolutely hell for all providers. Doesn't matter under which CETA they fell or under the QCO. We can, it's a fact, all businesses have seriously struggled in this past two years. So in order to, to get things done, we all started sending emails, our subject lines are not even according to which department in any way. So thousands of emails are being sent, especially to the QSTO, I would think, because you're not sending it to one CETA. Now you're sending it to the QSTO and they have to deal with 21 of them. I mean, can you imagine the impact on them? I'm trying to look at both ways. So if, if I had to sit on the general email address in the QSTO's um, department, say for instance, the info at QSTO. Can you imagine the number of emails they get per day? They have to sift through each one to see to which department does this need to go? Uh, we get upset, there is delays. I don't think they have all the capacity that they want and need in order to answer everybody's questions and emails on a daily basis. I think it's impossible at this stage. They've also changed their website from applications going in hard copies from online. They had online um, problems and issues and hiccups. And we're all shouting and aren't, aren't we supposed to ask the question, how can we help in order to make a smooth process for all of us. So we all want to go and fight and take a baseball bat, but have we actually asked what can we do in order to make it a better process for all of us, the providers and the QSTR? So that's that's where I'm at at the moment. Yes, it's quite interesting you're talking about the email subject line. I, was, um, I, I, I got a, a query and... I wanted to, to search it on my emails and um, I eventually found the, the complaint that went to the CETAS and the subject line was something totally different. Uh, you know, someone just replied to that and yeah, I just got very confusing anyway. So now, okay, I've got a problem with the CETA. I'm not their best friend and I feel, I feel, I feel, you know, um, a lot of things that I, I can't mention now. If I want to tackle with the CETA, uh, what is the different departments? Because as I said, everyone thinks the uh, CETA has got their head office, they've got regional offices, but also within the, the offices, they have different departments. Um, Janine, maybe you want to, uh, if you can expand on the CETAS and uh, Linnell, if you don't mind answering that one for the QCTO specifically. Janine? Yes, certainly is. So anything to do with accreditation related, on any of the CETA's website, it will have a list of all the people's names, their surnames, their email addresses, and the department that is actually dealing with whatever comes under the CETA's organogram. So anything related to accreditation should only go to the accreditation department or it might be known as ETQA. Some of the websites have actually listed it as ETQA. Some of the websites, if you go on, it will actually have a username and login if the provider is already accredited. And then it'll say, are you a learner? Are you an SDP, a training provider? All right, are you an assessor or you're a moderator? 
So if you're an assessor and moderator and you're following up on your assessor and moderator re-registrations or registrations or applications, you must only deal with the assessor and moderator departments. You mustn't deal with the online applications or the LMIS division. If you are enrolling learners, then you must only deal with the learner enrollment division. Don't put that email to the accreditation division because the accreditation division doesn't deal with the learner enrollments. So we often get clients phoning us and they say, ah, oh, the CETAs are so useless. I've been following up with them for like two or three years and I've never heard from them. And I go, now why would you wait for two or three years to actually do something about it? I often say to people, if you're sending an email and it's an important email and you don't get a response after two or three days, don't you pick up the phone and try and phone that person? And then if you don't get a response and you send another email, and then two or three days you don't get a response, maybe the email address that you're using is incorrect. Try a different avenue. Look at Zeta websites. They've all updated their details and announce 100% correct. The CETAs, you know, to actually be working with the CETA or the QCTO during the pandemic, it's been an absolute nightmare for them. They're not a private company. They can't pivot quickly. They've got a lot of red tape that they've got to get through. I would hate to be that info QCTO. I would absolutely hate to be that person. Um, is another thing that I say to people is be careful of your language that you use with the staff at the CETA. We had a provider send an email to one of the CETAs and the provider called them an imbecile. Now, if I got an email and somebody called me an imbecile, I'm not going to be very quick to respond to that email. So I know people get frustrated. That, that's what we do, okay? We do it 24 seven. We've been doing it for 12 years. Um, a lot of our clients, they're busy trying to run their training companies and they're trying to get accredited and trying to do registrations and trying to, to do learn enrollments and exiting and external moderation. And it's not their core focus. So maybe they'll resend the email once a month. You can't do that. You've got to be on the ball and actually send it and be consistent. And as you say, is the biggest thing from your going back to your question is to ensure that you're actually responding and you're communicating with the right division. That is so important. And all, as I said, all of that information is on the CETA's website and it does list the right people. Um, as I was saying, you know, a lot of us, what we did during the beginning of the pandemic when we found that the seats were just non-existent, is that we ended up copying in every single email address that there was available. Now imagine if there's 50 staff members and there's 50 emails and 50 people are doing that. How on earth are the seats ever expected to get through their emails? So is are we finding that a lot of clients that try and correspond and communicate with the CETAs, they're actually just not communicating with the right division. And this is the most important tip that I can give to the providers out there. Thank you, Janine. Lanelle, specifically on the QCTO. Um, the QCTO is for trade certificates. Uh, you know, everyone that, that phone us here, they want a trade certificate. And I think that is what the QCTO is doing. I'm, I'm thinking there was one person. Is that correct? There's a lot of departments. There's a lot of people. Not enough. I can tell you now, there's not enough. There's not enough to... Um, to sit and, and respond to each and every provider on a daily basis. So I believe there is a capacity problem. I think we know this um, because there have been budget cuts. We know this. It was published. So if you don't have the staff and you don't have the capacity behind the screens and doing site visits and doing applications and verification of phase one and phase two and phase three and writing reports and everybody's going to get upset with you. Hmm. So there's different departments. There's your accreditation department um, where we've changed from the hard copy application to the online application. Unfortunately, we do have a slight glitch there 
And I know this is a problem because uh, we've debated this and we've asked for, for a solution. And I'm, I'm sure they are busy with a, with a solution, hopefully very soon, is once you do the online application on the QCO's website, you don't have a copy of what you've sent. Hmm. So your date stamp, the time and date. So if you don't take screenshots, you don't have proof that you did it. So hopefully the system gets it to the correct person, but we've got no proof. So I always tell people, take screenshots so that you've got something. And then at the last um, page, it will tell you, here's the email address, use it, follow up. They give you the information in who to email, but no one does it. So again, like um, Janine said, they wait for two years. They don't follow up. I mean, come on. This is your business. So why don't you follow up in a week's time to say, did you receive my online application? Not to 20 people, to the allocated email address. And make sure this, the subject line is correct. For learner enrollments, it doesn't help you sing it to, um, uh, let's say, accreditations. They don't deal with it. There's different departments. There's a department for learner enrollments. There's a department for accreditation. There's a department for verification. There's different departments. And all you have to do is your subject line is to be correct. You send it to info at QSTO or central office at QSTO. And they delegate it to the correct department. I mean, your subject line could be urgent. Okay. You've sent it 50 times, but urgent for what? Is it a letter of intent? And all you did is list unit standards only, which is a big issue because people apply with a letter of intent for unit standards. Now, the person sitting in the QCO's office needs to go through each and every unit standard number, saying, but it's not a full qualification. But it says you can only apply for full qualifications, but they get letters of intent for unit standards. Can you imagine the number of unit standards and yeah. letters being submitted for what? The backlog gets bigger because we are unable to read these days. We need to go back to basics. Read. Read. Take that email address. Follow up. Do a weekly follow up and keep the evidence of your follow ups. And then we escalate. You always use a reporting line. No matter your business, you've got a reporting line. You start from the bottom and then you go to the top. Yes, uh, we had a, a nice incident last week where one of the CETAS um, directed everyone to the QCTO for unit standard um, letter of intents. And we had uh, a big fight. <laughs> Sometimes the communication, there might be a communication problem there. Okay. Um, between the two of you now, you use now different terminologies. And I just want to make sure because a lot of new training providers don't know these, these things, you know. And I find it a lot. I think on one of our uh, one of our assessments, it ask um, contact you. What is your ETQA? Uh, what under what ETQA you fall under? And everyone always come and ask me and ask me, what does that mean? Okay, so we have now words ETQA, and I've got an email from someone in Sakwa, uh, uh, not Sakwa, QCTO this morning. QA. Um, uh, uh, Janine, do you want to maybe just uh, um, explain to me ETQA, QA, is there any other terminologies we can come back to, to Linnell if there's anything else uh, that... All right. Is your ETQA, a lot of people don't understand that or haven't heard of that. They're so used to referring to the CETAs as a CETA, yeah. which stands for Sector Education Training Authority. Now, ETQA stands for Education Training Quality Authority. So you have, at the moment, 21 different ETQAs, which all fall under the QCTO. So, or you could call an ETQA a CETA, because that's what they really are. Um, on the letters that a lot of providers are receiving, it will refer to ETQA from QCTO. So it's important that they know those terminologies. But I go back to people's QMS. In your QMS, you should have terms and definitions. 
And in those terms and definitions, you will find words like ETQA, QA. So Ezra, QA is one of the words that is so interchangeable in our industry because it could be a quality assurer, a QAP, quality assuring partner. Um, a lot of the terminology is very interconnected depending on the sentence that you're using it in. So that's just from my side, and now I'm sure you'll come up with something from your side of DQP, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Sometimes I feel I need a dictionary when I, you know, when I start with these things, you know. Linnell. Oh, my goodness. And the abbreviations go on. We haven't stopped with this. I mean, it's an AQP and a DQP and a QAP. And my goodness, there's so many Qs these days. We don't know what Q to stand in and what Q to follow. <laughs> so under the keys to uh, we've got the AQP, which is the assessment quality partner. Then we've got the DQP, which is the development quality <laughs> partner. Then we've got the QAP, which is the quality assurance partner. And there's so many abbreviations coming up and we have to start learning um, to go with a change. Um, under the CETAs, we had a lot of abbreviations. Um, a lot of abbreviations will continue and we'll start adapting. But if you look at the QSTO's policies, all these abbreviations are there. It's it's not as if it started yesterday. It's been there. Yeah, Our I, problem is we don't read, we don't make a list of the new abbreviations to yes. understand. And maybe we must just um, take a step back, go through their policies, take those abbreviations, add it to our QMS to make sense of it, do a little flow chart of, yeah. okay, this is what I understand, this is how it works, and it will just become so much easier, a little flow chart of the differences. I've done it before and now I understand it, but I had to go and read the policies. Mm. It's there, it's published. Mm. They've published, I think, another um, three, two or three policies um, three weeks ago. Did we bother to, to go and read it? 99% of providers haven't. I can. Mm. promise you that now i'll read it maybe maybe in-house you know as a tip australian yeah. providers we should actually use the terminology internally also and not only when we communicate with the CETOS. now uh, guys i just want to recap again i've got a complaint and i don't even know myself the CETOS or qcto so so you guys spoke about this and there's an accreditation department, which I assume is doing accreditation from providers and checking. Then I think, uh, Janine, you said there is a uh, 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 learner enrollment department that works with enrollments. That's correct, Jess. Okay. And then, then we also get, I've, one of the theaters I've noticed that they've got a project department. I don't know if that's maybe certain projects. So you deal with that person to, to if, you, if it's a special project that you deal with. Um, I've also had, obviously, the finance department. <laughs> that is that's for all the refunds and the, the payments they must do to the client. So that there's, there's a department just for that finance. And then there is also, I think they call it the skills, the, specifically with the CETAS, a skills department when you work you know with stfs when they work with uh, online systems uh, i don't know if there's anything else with the CETOS basic departments that we've left out uh, is you've basically covered everything so that's sounding good um, some of those departments are broken down into further departments some of the CETAS have separate chambers so, like, for example, the services CETA will have a chamber for the hairdressing and beauty. They will have a chamber for the hiring of equipment. They'll have, they'll have different chambers. So if you no. wanted to go further, 
then you would deal with the chambers as well. So the departments that I've mentioned are just the very basic departments. Um, you can drill down quite a lot. But what I always suggest to everybody, and exactly what Lanella is saying, is a lot of times the information that you actually want is on the websites. It's there. And they have Q&As. And they tell you exactly if this is going wrong, try this. If this is going wrong, try that. So it's not that the CETA's websites don't have information. They've got more than enough information. But as I also find Train You Can's website is a very good website because Train You Can pulls in all the information from all the CETAs. And I know it's linking into the training providers forum that you've set up. So I also encourage people to look at those two websites as well if they want any updates. Do you know, sorry to interrupt you, do you know? If there's uh, CETOS, it's actually quite interesting point um, to get the structure of a CETO. Do you know of any CETO offhand that actually published the structure, you know, like an organogram uh, on a document? Um, as well, most of them do. If you go and have a look at it, you'll see all of that information on their website and it'll actually show you that under their governance structure. Oh. So the CETOS have to remember that the CETOS are a public mm -hmm. entity. So they have to be very transparent with their books and their finances and their spending and everything. So the public are very open to going having a look at all of that information. Most of the time it's found at the bottom of their websites. So you just have to go and do a little bit of digging. But okay. I always encourage the providers. So if a provider is accredited with um, MRCT CETA, then they must really get to know MRCT CETA's website because MRCT CETA is one of their stakeholders now. They're almost like a business partner with them. So they should build a relationship. And the way you build a relationship is you find out about information. So I always want to encourage providers to go onto the CETA websites, look at the different divisions and contact the right people. And they'll find that the assistance will be more forthcoming to pick up what Linnell said as well is a subject line. If you are inquiring about accreditation, put the accreditation inquiry, put your company name, put your registration number. Don't just say, hi there. Oh, they don't know where to actually forward your email. So that subject line is very, very important. I think one of the things I'm gonna do after this webinar is visiting CETA's websites and see if I can get some structures. I've never thought about that. Linnell, QCTO, do they have the same type of departments as a CETA? Yeah, they've got various departments and um, every, every little department deals with something specific. So if it's your, and a lot of people don't know this, but learner uploads. I mean, it's not rocket science. You don't have to wait for windows and stuff. It's quarterly. You have to submit it. There's two Excel spreadsheets that you submit. You won't get a reply um, maybe in the first week or the first two weeks because there's a lot of people submitting and they have to actually filter through and go through the information. There is a manual, but um, I've heard of providers, they got the accreditation and that's where it ended. They don't even know that you can upload learner results. I mean, it has to go to the learner department. The emails are there. Accreditation needs to go to the accreditation team. Verifications goes to the verification team. So um, the info um, email must be going berserk at the moment, like seriously. Yeah. Um, but the subject line is important. So if you don't know to which department, your go-to email address is info and your central office. But your subject line is important because they will delegate it to the correct department. And at times they even follow up for you. It's also, again, it's, it's your tone. You know what? This is information that you need. This is your business. This is your learners. So let's be nice to each other let's get a solution and move forward. But being, um, yeah, 
some of the emails are no, no. So we can't get into a boxing ring. It doesn't work like that anymore. So it seems to be the QCTO has got a better uh, 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 platform where you can use one email. It seems to be, you know, as more of us going to start working with the QCTO, um, maybe their system is going to eliminate a lot of problems that we had historically with the with the CETAS. Now, from from you guys' uh, feedback, obviously, the subject line is important. You guys, uh, Janine and you, Linnell, keep on saying subject line, okay? So the subject line must be to the point that we can see what department it is. Then I think, Janine, you also mentioned something on the about put your accreditation number or the qualification, put a detail on there so when they get the query that they know what training provider you're talking about or what, you know, uh, we, we like to give uh, a complaint, but the, 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 the actual detail is not in there. And I think one tip that I found over the years, um, when, whenever I sent an email, because I think when we're working with emails, and you sent it is in your sent folder. So what I do is I also email it to myself. So it comes into my inbox again and there it lies on my inbox and I will only delete it once I'm done with it. So that is a trick or you know, even if you email it to yourself, I drag it over to my calendar and say, uh, uh, remind me again on that day. So that's a trick, a personal trick that I learned over the years. Okay. So I'm going to, I've got a, 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 a problem with the CETA, uh, it could be a generic problem, or with the QCTO. Um, how should I uh, struct, what should be in that body? Obviously, we spoke about the tone, but what, what details roughly um, must be in the body of that email information that you want to get? I know sometimes some people email me, they and it, it feels like I'm reading a book. There's, 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 there's so many, uh, you know, they, they give you the whole life story and what they think. And, and you know, you need to sift there and find out what is the actual detail. Who wants to go first on this one? I see both as nothing. Uh, is it's so often that's what happens. And I mean, both of us, all of us are talking about the amount and the volume of the emails that the CETA staff need to actually go through on a daily basis. So the best advice I can give is, first of all, take out the emotion. No, I'm frustrated. You are stopping me from earning money. What is wrong with you? Um, do you need what is it? Do you need a lesson on communicating? None of it. Take that away, right? And literally, it's in your first summary. If you go back to the structure of communication, in the first summary, it could be something about, Dear John, I'm writing to you to inquire about the following up of my application. The next, so now in the first sentence, the person reading it knows exactly what your email is all about. And then in the next paragraph, it's you put the details when you submitted it, or any inquiry, what date you submitted it, who you submitted it to. Um, if it's for learn enrollments, you could attach the enrollments of the Excel spreadsheet or any proof that was that came from the website, uh, any of the screenshots that you've taken. So it's to keep it very short and sweet. Introduction, what your email is about. Second paragraph, what it is that you're trying to find out. And the third paragraph is, please let me know if you are the right person that I should be communicating with or whether I should speak to somebody else. So that last sentence should be an action item. What is it that you want the person to actually do? Now, in your mind, you want them to do something, but you've got to tell them, what is that something? Do you want them to let you know how far your application is? or your learn enrollments, or do, are you following up on a site visit date or an external moderation visit date? What is it that you want them to do? And we can, in essence, to give somebody a deadline is always good practice. So if you want a response, you always want to say to people, could you please give me this response by this day? 
sometimes it works. It doesn't always work. No. All right. But you've got your deadlines. And if you let the person who's reading your email know your deadline, maybe they will work according to your deadline as well. So, you know, the worst thing that I always say to people is, um, is to use the terminology as soon as possible. When is as soon as possible? Is it today? Is it in a week's time? Is it in a month's time? My as soon as possible is today. Because I'm Janine impatient, not topping. All right, and that's just who I am. But other people's as soon as possible might be in a week or a month's time. So it's the structure of the email body that really needs to ensure that it addresses those criteria. To recap, first paragraph, what is your email about? What is it that you're following up, up about or what is it that you want? The second one is the details of everything. And then the closing paragraph is what is the next step? What is it that you want your reader to actually do? Ezra, you're so correct. I often receive emails from prospective clients and it takes me like 10, 15 minutes to read it because it's just, there's so much emotion involved. And, you know, anybody reading emails nowadays, you've only got a small little window to read and then you onto your work. So you're right. When it comes to sending people their life stories, the person reading it doesn't always want to know the background. So I would suggest keep the emotion out and concentrate on the facts. Thank you, Janine. A very interesting. So you've summarized it there for us, the, the topic, the information or the data, the, the content, and then the type of a resolution. Linnell, I don't, I don't know if you want to add on to what uh, Janine said, um, but I also want to ask you now that I have spoken to a person at the CETA or the QCTO and I don't get a response. So say for example i think the one tiny provider said that they got something about 50 learners they're trying to get feedback on their verification since february 2021 that was one of the complaints and that's quite a serious um complaint so uh, I, what what should i do when i get to a point and my contact i don't get joy from my contact but can i just pick up the phone and phone the qcto or can i try and get the department of higher education blade in some monday oh wow <laughs> no <laughs> <What Whoa. is laughs> okay i would not find it no definitely not so if you have a specific issue, let's say your issue have been going on for a year. Okay. Clearly something's gone wrong. It's either the way you communicate or your communication has gone nowhere. It's in space somewhere because the person that used to assist you um, no longer works there, for instance. So there's always a reporting line. If it is, uh, learner uploads under the CETA, for instance, and there's issues. If you really need to, then you go to your QA manager or your ETQA manager. There's various titles at the moment. They're not all the same as yet. But start escalating it within the CETA if it's a CETA problem. You escalate it until the CEO. And if you don't have joy there, then you go to the QCO. And you do a summary email, very short and sweet. This is the issue. But you could attach a document where you've got all your timelines, who you send it to, the date you send it, no response. You can actually have a whole history attached, but your summary must be short and sweet in your email because maybe that's all they need. Maybe it's not the first time that a provider has come to the QCO with the same problem. So they know exactly this is the issue. That person doesn't work there anymore. Um, the CEO has been suspended or, you know, but there's always a reporting line. You don't just jump to the QCO or to D8. I mean, they would want to ask you all the different questions saying, so what have you done? 
Where's the evidence? What have you submitted? What responses have you gotten? If you haven't re uh, received a response for over a year, um, did your email actually reach them? Or is it sitting in their spam box with 2,000 other emails sitting in their spam box? You don't know. Pick up the phone and ask if, if you can get through. I mean, during um, last year and the year before, it was absolutely horrendous trying to get hold of anyone because everybody was working remotely. So it was virtually impossible. But always keep a trail of all your emails as evidence on that specific subject. Um, but I wouldn't just go to the DA because they're going to turn around and say, um, okay, so you only dealt with one person in the CETA. Um, have you escalated it? What have you done to solve the problem? So we give all our problems, but have we thought about the solution and escalating it correctly according to the reporting line? The details are on the, on the websites. Why don't we use it? Again, we don't read. All we have to do is go look at the structure and then start escalating. Don't email all 50 people because who do you want to answer you? All 50 of them? No. So th that's what we need to do. We have to use the correct reporting line, start from the bottom, and then move your way up. But don't just send it to D8 and accuse DO. Let's start where the problem starts, and then we start escalating it. But there's always a reporting line. If you start messing around with a reporting line, you're going to get nowhere. Uh, Linnell, uh, sorry, I just want to add the, um, I thought the QCTO is the boss. They're the boss of <laughs> the us. So shouldn't they sort out uh, the, the, the problems? Um, what? <laughs> uh, Wouldn't that be nice? That is the dream. Some CETAs, not all, some CETAs are absolute pleasure to work with. Like, really, um, if only all the CETAs could work in the same manner. I think there's different pressures on, on, on the different CETAs. I mean, you can't compare a CETA that's got 100 accredited providers with one that's got 3,500 providers. The pressure is quite a bit more. And the more providers, the more learners, the more admin people of providers are all sending the same email to one person at a CETA, for instance, yeah. and it's like, it's chaos. So step back, look at the issue. Are you actually sending it to the correct department? If you're not, find out. Look at the website. Janine said, there, the website's there. People's names are there. Email addresses are there. All you have to do is go and look on the website. Get the information. It's there. Um, we need to stop blaming everyone for all our problems. Go onto the website ourselves um, and ask for help. Ask for assistance. Uh, we get that a lot on social media. Um, help me. I want the accreditation. Then we say with what? Oh, I want to be facilitator. Um, okay, no, you can't be a creator. You need to be a legal entity. Read the policies. Read the guidelines. Know your NKF. Know who SACWA is. I mean, let's start reading. And when we do send an email, it's because there's really a problem. We know what the solution could be. Um, but we need help and guidance in order to carry on with business. Uh, thank you, Linnell, for that. And thank you, Janine. I think when the CETAS and the, the CEO of the QCTO is going to look at our webinar today, they're going to think, hell, those two as excellent promoters for, for us. <laughs> well done. I think we, we, we learned quite a lot, um, you know, uh, from, from our discussion. And yes, uh, even myself have a lot of uh, frustration sometimes with the CETAS. The One of the problems we do have um, is some CETAS remove 
all the contact details from the website. So, so that is a, it's a, it's a, it's a common problem. I understand why they don't want to do it publicly. Someone yesterday or Tuesday in a, in a webinar, I think it was Sharon, mentioned that a lot of CETAS, you know, if you are, if you registered on the LMS system, their contact details appears now in the LMS system. So they only want, you know, the right people to, to see that. So maybe that is some of the CETAS. Um, but it can definitely become an, 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 an obstacle. For, uh, one of them is uh, uh, SACWA. SACWA totally removed their email address from their website. There's no way to be found on their website. So you can only contact them on telephone uh, if they answer. Um, and, and, you know, I have been told that we know that the QCD had to lay off a whole lot of people. So we I do understand that they under stop. But sometimes I've also found out a trick, you know, if you if you use old friend Google and you Google QCTO contact details, you many times find uh, old documents and stuff that might still have email addresses up. And then obviously, you know, contact consultants like the two of you that uh, maybe will take uh, the, the, the matter further. Now, I know both of you, uh, uh, Janine, you deal with the CETAS and QCTO. Linnell, you focus now only mainly on the, on the QCTO. Um, I know you two separate consultants. So if I have a problem, can I come to you to help me with my problem? <laughs> Janine, you first. Yes, of course. But please don't ex expect us to do it for free. <laughs> we're, we are a company. We're a team of eight. We have rent to pay. So absolutely, very happy you. to help people. <laughs> Linnell, and <on> your side? <laughs> sure. You also Ava. like to fight. <laughs> You know what, if if it's a, a fight to to get fairness and um, to get um, a business up and running, I will fight. Believe me, um, I will fight. But the problem needs to be a real problem. Yeah. And if you haven't, if you really haven't gone out of your own way to solve your own problems, and you want to make your problem my problem, um, it has to be a real problem and you have to have evidence that you at least tried and you did follow everything possible in order to get a solution. Otherwise you can't you do anything. If, no, you can come to me. But if you even haven't if you haven't tried, don't even don't even bother sending me an email because I'm going to ask you the same questions. I mean, if, if your kid has got a problem, are you just going to run out to pick and pay and, and find someone there to go and sort your problems? No, you're first going to try and do this yourself mm. because it's your business, it's your learners, it's your staff. So you have to really try and do this yourself. Yes, we do help where we can. I don't have a, a solution for all the problems. I wish I did. There are problems that we don't have solutions for as yet, but there's nothing wrong in trying to find a solution for a client. Guys, I'm going to say many, many, many thanks. And again, our video will be posted on YouTube and we will be in post also Janine, our two guest speakers, Janine and Renel, your contact details on there. So if you want to contact any of our guest speakers, that uh, that answered so many and gave us so many helpful tips today. Um, myself, I can't wait to, to finish the webinar because I want to get onto Google and visit some CETA websites and look for some CETA structures because I think that is going to be awesome resources for a lot of people. So I'm very excited. I've learned myself uh, quite a lot, you know, on on how to tackle these uh, these 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 complaints and the different departments uh, in there. And I just want to say many thanks again, Janine and Linnell, for your detail, uh, for your time that you've put out for our talkie block. And I hope to have um, another 
couple of talky blocks and uh, soon with you too. Many thanks for your help and your resources. Thanks, today. Ezra. Thanks, Ezra. Thanks, Janine. Thanks, Ezra. Cheers for now. Bye.